You mistake stars reflected in a pond for the night sky. Vilgeforts of Rogavine, the wizard responsible for leading the mages during the first Northern Nilfgaardian War's climax, the Battle of Sodden Hill. The man who then forged the peace established after the battle. A mage so powerful, both in raw power and political influence, that he once told King Demavend of Edern that he had no time for him at the moment. Young, even for a sorcerer, he only looked thirty-five at most. A tall, well-built man, good-looking and with a sincere voice. He would often say one thing but mean another, and most of his questions were anything but innocent. When Geralt first met him, he knew that people like him were completely unpredictable. But who was he really? What happened after Sodden? Well, needless to say, Vilgeforts gained in power dramatically. After the First War, the chapter of wizards looked to him for guidance on more than one occasion. One such occasion is, of course, the looming Second War with Nilfgaard. When it became clear that the North was considering war, two mages were sent to Vilgeforts asking for his advice. How should they respond to the Northern Monarchs planning another war without consulting them? Vilgeforts didn't quite give them the answers they were hoping for, unfortunately. He was far too busy with his own plans. You see, Vilgeforts liked power. He already had quite a bit of that, but he wanted more. He wanted all of it. To that end, he had decided he wished to capture Cyrilla of Sintra, the child of the Elder Blood. He planned to force a pregnancy, rip out her placenta, and use it to gain her powers for himself. There was one small problem with that. He didn't have Ciri. Just after Ciri was born, Vilgeforts had approached Emir Vaemris, her father, proposing a partnership, assuring him that he only wanted power in the new empire once he had put Emir back on the throne of Nilfgaard. He persuaded the soon-to-be emperor by showing him the prophecy that told him Ciri would birth the savior of the world one day. This prophecy was not something Vilgeforts himself believed in, or at least he didn't put much trust in its accuracy. He merely told Amir to get him on his side, and this worked. This way, Vilgeforts could get close enough to Ciri to, in an unguarded moment, snatch her away. But fate did not take kindly to his plans. When Emir and Vilgeforts tried to take Ciri out of Sintra, Pavetta caught wind of their plan and found a way to smuggle Ciri to safety. Emir went on to become Emperor of Nilfgaard and Ciri remained in Sintra. Not too long after Emir took the throne, he attempted to take Ciri from Sintra, during the First War, of course. But he failed again and now no one knew where Ciri was. Vilgeforts seemed to have given up on Emir helping him in this case. During Sodden Hill, he fought on the side of the North, and now, here he was, on the verge of a second war with Nilfgaard, with no idea where Ciri was. So, instead, he was attempting to locate Yennefer of Vengerberg to grill her on the girl's whereabouts. Yennefer, however, proved equally difficult to find, even through Vilgeforts' powerful magic. And the two mages visiting him didn't exactly help in finding her either. So, instead, Vilgeforts now proposed to the two mages of the chapter a grand meeting at Thanet Isle. Every important mage would have to attend, and they could discuss the war. In truth, Vilgeforts had already decided he would side with Nilfgaard during this war, and this banquet was a marvelous opportunity for him. He would attempt to seduce others to join his side, and he could inquire about Ciri. Perhaps Yennefer would even bring the girl herself. Because Yennefer, as a member of the Council of Sorcerers, would surely have to attend. And so it was that Thanet Isle was soon swarming with powerful mages, all eager to attend the ball. Powerful mages and one witcher. Geralt had been invited by Yennefer to join him, and he drew quite the crowd. Vilgeforts, too, was very interested in having a chat with our witcher. And Vilgeforts wasn't someone you refused easily. So, Geralt and him took a walk through the Gallery of Glory, a hallway in Aratuza lined with paintings of historically important events involving magic. 
But Vilgefortz didn't bring Geralt here to discuss art, of course. He wanted Geralt to join his side, the side he was quite sure would win the war. Not because he needed Geralt to win said war, but because he thought it would be easier to get a hold of Ciri if Geralt was willing to cooperate. He explained to Geralt that the day after the banquet, the members of the chapter and the Council of Wizards would convene in Garstang, a palace on Thanet Isle. There they would debate about the future of the magical community in the coming war. And he used this conversational bridge to casually inquire why Geralt never became a mage himself. His mother was, after all, a sorceress, but Geralt didn't really think parentage was an important factor in anyone's future career. Though he did then ask Vilgefortz about his parents instead. As it turned out, Vilgefortz had no idea who his parents were. The Druid Circle in Kovir had found Vilgefortz in the gutter in Lan Exeter. They took him in and educated him, as a druid, of course. Vilgefortz didn't seem all too happy about this. He called druids a kind of mutant, a wanderer who travels the world and bows to sacred oaks. During certain druidic rituals, Vilgefortz's gift would show, pointing quite clearly to his origins. He was born by accident, and at least one of his parents was a mage. The person who discovered my modest abilities was, of course, a sorcerer, whom I met by accident, continued Vilgefortz calmly. He offered me a tremendous gift, the chance of an education and of self-improvement, with a view to joining the Brotherhood of Sorcerers. And you, said the Witcher softly, accepted the offer. No, said Vilgefortz, his voice becoming increasingly cold and unpleasant. I rejected it in a rude, even boorish way. I unloaded all my anger on the old fool. I wanted him to feel guilty, he and his entire magical fraternity. Guilty, naturally, for the gutter in Lan Exeter. Guilty that one or two detestable conjurers, bastards without hearts or human feelings, had thrown me into that gutter at birth, and not before, when I wouldn't have survived. The sorcerer, it goes without saying, didn't understand, wasn't concerned by what I told him. He shrugged and went on his way, by doing so branding himself and his fellows with the stigma of insensitive, arrogant whoresons, worthy of the greatest contempt. Vilgefortz, at that point in his life, was quite sick of druids, so he left the sacred oak trees and ventured off into the world. He took on many roles, some he's still ashamed of till this day. He became a soldier for hire, leading the life you would expect of one. A victorious soldier, a beaten soldier, a marauder, robber, rapist, murderer, and finally a fleeing fugitive. Fleeing to the end of the world, running from the noose he had earned for himself. And then he met a woman, a sorceress. Their relationship was a complicated one, to say the least. He couldn't cope with the feelings he had for her, and she didn't exactly try to help him understand, so he left her. Because she was, in his words, promiscuous, arrogant, spiteful, unfeeling, and cold. Because it was impossible to dominate her, and her domination of him was humiliating to Vilgefortz. He left her because he knew she was only interested in him because of his intelligence, but he was not a sorcerer, and she usually only graced sorcerers with more than one knight. And so far he had managed to obscure the fact that he wasn't one. He left her because she was like his mother. He suddenly understood his feelings for her. It was not love at all, but a mixture of fear, regret, fury, pangs of conscience, and the need for expiation. A sense of guilt, loss, and hurt. A perverse need for suffering and atonement. What he felt for that woman was hate. I left her, he said after a while, and then I couldn't live with the emptiness which engulfed me. And I suddenly understood it wasn't the absence of a woman that causes that emptiness, but the lack of everything I had been feeling. It's a paradox, isn't it? 
I imagine I don't need to finish. You can guess what happened next. I became a sorcerer out of hatred. And only then did I understand how stupid I was. I mistook stars reflected in a pond at night for those in the sky. After telling Geralt his life story, Vilgefortz then outright tells Geralt to join him. When Geralt declines, the mage brings Ciri into the equation and threatens the Witcher. If Geralt doesn't join Vilgefortz, he says, he'll lose Ciri too. Later that night, however, the battle had already begun. Vilgefortz was not the only one plotting. The sorcerers of the north were aware that something was going on, and in the dead of night, they apprehended those suspected of working with Nilfgaard. Lydia van Bredevoort, Vilgefortz's assistant, who was hopelessly in love with her master, was killed in the scuffle when she attacked those taking Vilgefortz away in shackles. The mages captured and the mages doing the capturing then convened in Garstang to talk this out. Unfortunately, during this talk, Yennefer teleported in with Ciri, and Ciri started prophesizing. She told of the assassination of Vizimir, which was in fact carried out by an accomplice of Vilgefortz, and she told of the start of the war, prompting Tessayad of Rhys to decide that Vilgefortz and his companions were innocent of collusion with Nilfgaard, and she dropped the magical barrier around the island, giving the mages an opening to start all-out mayhem. Francesca called for her Scoia'tael unit to back her up, and it became quite clear that they had been in league with Nilfgaard after all. Spells started flying as the two sides fought a miserable battle that no one could truly win, only survive. Tessaya, realizing her mistake, only as she saw the corpses pile up, then tried to restrain Vilgefortz again, but he only ridiculed and mocked her. And in the chaos, Vilgefortz slipped away in search of Ciri. Eventually, Geralt found Vilgefortz at the foot of Tor Lara, the Tower of the Gulls. Ciri had escaped into the tower, and the Witcher and the Mage were left to figure out who was to follow her up. Vilgefortz once more offered Geralt to join his side, and noted that he didn't care about the people Geralt killed today. They were meaningless to him. Geralt fired back that he forgot death had no meaning to Vilgefortz, particularly the deaths of other people. But the mage insisted that it was merely payback for the times Vilgefortz had sent assassins after Geralt. He again offered to walk to the top of the tower to get Ciri together, who he was sure was dying of fright up there. Vilgefortz would get what he wanted from Ciri, and so would Emir, whom he would send a double of Ciri instead of the real deal. And Ciri and Geralt could live happily ever after, after Vilgefortz got what he wanted. Geralt, time and time again, rejected his offer and then brought Lydia into the conversation. Poor Lydia, who had loved Vilgefortz, though he did not love her back. Lydia, who was horribly mutilated during some dangerous experiments, Vilgefortz had recommended she take part in. Lydia, who, without a second thought, died for Vilgefortz when he ordered her to do so. I really have no desire to kill you. I kill with reluctance. Indeed. What about Lydia van Bredevoort? The sorcerer sneered. Speak not that name, Witcher. Geralt gripped the hilt of his sword tightly and smiled scornfully. Why did Lydia have to die, Vilgefortz? Why did you order her death? She was meant to distract attention from you, wasn't she? She was meant to give you time to become resistant to Dimeritium, to send a telepathic signal to Rience, wasn't she? Poor Lydia. The artist with the damaged face. Everyone knew she was expendable. Everyone knew that except her. Be silent. You murdered Lydia, wizard. You used her, and now you want to use Ciri? With my help? No, you will not enter Tor Lara. A stout, magical, two-yard staff then materialized in Vilgefortz's hand, and their battle finally commenced. Only later would Geralt realize that this was a battle he could not win. 
all those years as a mercenary, traveling the world, fighting, then training as an archmage, had clearly had its effects. He fought like no other sorcerer ever would. Vilgefortz was incredibly fast, and his staff was not just magical, but also made of iron. Geralt was beaten into a pathetic mess, and his sword shattered. But Vilgefortz didn't kill Geralt, as he just didn't have the time to do so properly. He would only teach the Witcher a lesson. He left Geralt in shambles, while noting how happy he was to see Geralt bloody and beaten. Then he started up the stairs to the portal high in the tower. Or at least that's what Geralt thought. As he was falling into unconsciousness, however, Vilgefortz dealt one more fierce blow to the Witcher's thigh, crushing the shaft of his femur. Then Geralt fainted entirely. While Geralt was blacked out, Ciri entered the portal of the Tower of Gulls and caused the entire tower to explode as a result. Vilgefortz was caught in the explosion and lost much of his face, including one of his eyes. And after that, Vilgefortz disappeared from the world entirely. He hid in his secret hideout, Castle Stiga. Hidden from the world, he used a gem in his eye socket to slowly regenerate his face. Very slowly, making him look like a monster to any who would lay eyes on him. Now, he was hunted as well. Emir was convinced that Vilgefortz had betrayed him. And he had, of course. The Lodge of Sorceresses, which would soon be established, hunted him also, preventing him from ever teleporting, as they would easily find him. The Northern Monarchs, still left, wanted him dead. In fact, very few people didn't want him dead. He couldn't quite show his face anywhere anymore, and so had to rely on his henchmen to clean up the mess he'd left behind. Such as the older hideouts he'd used to practice his skills in. Dijkstra runs into one such hideout. An abandoned castle with a basement filled with corpses. Vilgefortz had sent Rienz to burn the place and destroy the evidence, but he had failed spectacularly. Dijkstra found a chair clearly used for experiments by Vilgefortz. The chair was meant to keep one's legs open, very open. Pregnant women had, while still alive, sat in that chair as Vilgefortz practiced his operating skills. He had cut open their abdomen and uterus and removed the fetus. Of the corpses found, Dijkstra could identify one, Jolie, a young woman that had disappeared a year ago. As her corpse was still relatively fresh, it seems Vilgefortz had kidnapped her, forcefully impregnated her, removed the fetus, then dumped her body in the cellar, not far from a pit filled with the bones of young girls. Vilgefortz had killed hundreds of young women in this castle. From his hideout, Vilgefortz now desperately searched for Ciri, and as he still couldn't go anywhere himself, he had to employ the aid of others. He sent henchmen all over the world in search of the girl. He even eventually made an alliance with Stefan Skellen and Leo Bonhart, both individuals who were also looking for Ciri, and almost got his hands on her this way. But again, she escaped at the last moment. Thankfully for Vilgefortz, Yennefer, in a desperate attempt to find Ciri, had attempted to teleport to his hideout. She barely survived the trip and was beaten mercilessly after arriving, but Vilgefortz, eager for the opportunity, then immediately dragged her broken body to his laboratory, where he hooked her up to his machines. This machine could locate Ciri, but only if it was linked to another person with powerful emotional ties to the girl, and only if Ciri cared for that person in the same way. Someone like Yennefer. Vilgefortz fed Yennefer some elixirs to activate the machine, and he urged her not to resist, to simply let him find Ciri through her. It wouldn't hurt if she just cooperated. Bend to his torture, give him her little girl so he could pluck out her eyes, as he promised Yennefer earlier. 
impregnate her, rip out her placenta, and throw her to Leo Bonhart again, as he'd promised the bounty hunter. Yennefer refused. She clenched her teeth so hard they cracked. Vilgefortz now, instead, tried to placate her, telling her that Ciri might be in danger, that she would be safe here, and once he got what he wanted from her, they'd both be free to go. That rather contradicted his earlier promises to both Yennefer, Rienz, and Leo Bonhart, of course. So Yennefer gritted her teeth even harder, until blood trickled down her chin. Vilgefortz, losing his patience, then called for Rienz instead and resorted to old-fashioned torture by using a thumbscrew and slowly turning the screws. Eventually, Yennefer's torpid, broken body was dragged out of the room towards the cellar. Yennefer had not given up Ciri's location. Unfortunately, by accident, Yennefer had thought of Geralt, and their feelings for each other were strong enough that Vilgefortz now knew where he was, and he sent Shiru the half-elf to kill him. Now, for a time, he left Yennefer imprisoned in a damp cell. But when Vilgefortz realized he might still need her again, as his people had lost track of Ciri, again, he moved her to a slightly warmer cell, and even invited her to dinner one time, where he spun lies about Ciri's and Geralt's deaths. Lies Yennefer quickly saw through. What Yennefer didn't realize was the real reason she was now being fed at a table and left in a nicer cell. Amirva Emrys was getting closer and closer to finding Vilgefortz, and the mage needed to get rid of him. So he sent Stefan Skellen to meet up with the Nilfgaardian conspirators, plotting to dethrone Emir, and offered them a way to get rid of the current emperor altogether. He intended to use mind control to force Yennefer to kill Emir, after which she'd commit suicide. It would all be under the guise of a mother scorned, angry at Amir for taking her daughter. The gathered nobles seemed interested, however it would never come to this. To ensure his loyalty, the conspirators, or more specifically Luvarden, demanded Skellen give away the location of Vilgefortz, Stiga Castle. This Skellen eventually did, and of course, Luvarden ran straight to Amir with this information. At this point, Ciri had found her way to Castle Stiga as well. She intended to offer herself to Vilgefortz freely, trading her life for that of Yennefer's. That didn't quite go as planned, however, as once inside of Stiga Castle, Ciri could no longer use her Elder Blood powers. She could no longer escape, and Vilgefortz knew this. He didn't need her to cooperate, and he didn't need to free Yennefer. He was free to drag her to his laboratory after threatening her with rape, beatings, and gouging out her eyes. Clearly fond of hearing himself talk, he explained to her his grand vision. I'm ashamed to admit it, he continued a moment later, rolling up his sleeves, but I'm terribly attracted by power. It's crude, I know, but I want to be a ruler. A ruler before whom people will bow down. Whom people will bless simply because I let them be. And whom they will worship as a god. If, let's say, I decide to save their world from a cataclysm, even if I only save it on a whim. Oh, Siri, my heart is gladdened by the thought of how magnanimously I shall reward the faithful, and how cruelly I shall punish the disobedient and arrogant. The prayers that shall be offered up by whole generations, to me and for me, for my love and my mercy, will be balm and honey to my soul. Whole generations, Siri! Whole worlds! Listen out! Do you hear it? Deliver us from the plague, hunger, war, and wrath of Vilgefortz. Honestly, he seemed quite mad as he talked, and foam started appearing around the corners of his mouth. He didn't care about the prophecy, he only wanted her blood. 
He explained what he would do to her, and as he did, Leo Bonhart suggested that they make Yennefer watch the horror unfold. And Vilgefortz agreed that this would be hilarious. But before they could drag Yennefer into the room, Geralt and his group entered Castle Stiga and started slaughtering the guards. When Vilgefortz was informed of what was going on, his face remained calm, but his restless and blinking eye betrayed his worry. Things suddenly happened quickly. Geralt's team scouring the halls for Ciri and Yennefer, Regis saving Ciri from the laboratory, Ciri then going after Yennefer, until eventually Geralt and Yennefer faced Vilgefortz. A fight of magic and swords broke out as balls of fire and lightning were thrown left, right and center and Geralt swung his sword at the mage again and again. Vilgefortz walked towards them, his cloak fluttering like a dragon's wings. I'm not surprised at Yennefer, he said as he walked. She is a woman and thus an evolutionarily inferior creature, governed by hormonal chaos. But you, Geralt, are not only a man who is sensible by nature, but also a mutant, invulnerable to emotions. He waved a hand. There was a boom and a flash. A lightning bolt bounced off the shield Yennefer had conjured up. In spite of your good sense, Vilgefortz continued to talk, pouring fire from hand to hand. In one matter you demonstrate astounding and foolish perseverance. You invariably desire to row upstream and piss into the wind. It had to end badly. Know that today, here in Stiga Castle, you have pissed into a hurricane. Geralt was hopeless against the sorcerer, and Yennefer's spells didn't even scratch him. Even Regis, a higher vampire, was no match. Though doubtless more because he didn't expect what Vilgefortz did. Regis charged in, in the form of a giant bat, but Vilgefortz cruelly reduced him to a molten pillar. With Yennefer eventually knocked out cold, Geralt fought Vilgefortz once more, and once more was losing horribly. The moment Vilgefortz lifted his rod to strike the finishing blow, Geralt gripped the fake Witcher medallion Fringilla Vigo had crafted for him tightly. And though Fringilla's medallion was a rather sorry excuse for a true Witcher medallion, it did have one positive effect. It was capable of casting an illusion around Geralt, and while it wasn't exactly a powerful illusion, Vilgefortz didn't expect it, and his one mangled eye certainly didn't make things easier. It gave Geralt exactly enough breathing room to slash the mage across the stomach, then again across the chest. Vilgefortz stared at his chest in disbelief for a moment, before screaming loudly as Geralt decapitated the bastard. And that was the end of Vilgefortz of Rogavine, once the most powerful mage in existence, defeated by a weak illusion conjured by a fake Witcher medallion. Had his eye still been intact, perhaps he'd never have fallen. Perhaps the world would now be ruled by Vilgefortz, the terrible. Thankfully, we'll never have to find out, because that day, the Witcher Geralt did his profession proud, ridding the world of the truest of monsters.